played for my nation, for my, my country, played in the World Cup. But I think this season uh, as a whole would have to rank as the, as the number one. Coming up on the official Celtic FC podcast, we're joined for part one of two of a special interview with former Celtic title winner Morton Vicorst. When you meet Matt, you 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 sense that he is a player who who wants to make the most of his career. He reflects on that special title win of 1998 and just what it's like to coach Matt O'Reilly at the Denmark national team. This is the official Celtic FC podcast. Yes, everybody, hello and welcome along to the official Celtic FC podcast, the only Celtic podcast out there where you can get exclusive interviews and insights from inside the Celtic changing room and on many occasions with former Celtic players. And I'm absolutely delighted to say that we have one on for this episode. It is a man that is fondly remembered around Celtic Park. He signed for the club in 1995 and he went on to make more than 100 appearances over a seven year spell and of course he was part of that famous squad in 1998 that delivered the league title to Celtic Park for the first time in 10 years. There's going to be so much to get through, the highs, the lows, the injuries, so much more. It's an incredible story. We've got none other than Morton Vicorst on the Celtic FC podcast. Morton, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm very well, and uh, it's a pleasure pleasure being here. Um, I've been looking forward to this. Very good. I've been looking forward to this as well, and hopefully the fans will be looking forward to hearing some amazing stories. But why don't we start off? Just let everybody know, Morton, what life is looking like for you these days? Well... I am still in football, still working football. I'm with um, the the Denmark team, um, uh, national team, uh, working as an assistant, uh, assistant to Casper Juhlmann. Um, and um, we're now looking forward to um, the Euros this later this year, uh, along with Scotland. So uh, uh, exciting times. And um, yeah, I'm enjoying life. I'm obviously back in Denmark. Not at the moment, I'm in Portugal. Um, um, meeting players and, and clubs, but um, I'm very well still keeping tabs on, on Celtic, of course. Of course you're keeping tabs on Celtic because Denmark have somebody in this Celtic squad who's a very, very important and influential player to us, Mr Matt O'Reilly. How much have you enjoyed watching his progress at Celtic and coaching him at Denmark? I mean, it's been amazing to see uh, Matt's progress, um, and it's it's um, it's a joy because he, when you meet Matt, you 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 sense that he is a player who who wants to make the most of his career. Uh, he does uh, everything possible to improve um, his own game, and he's a team player. Um, He's uh, with Denmark. You mentioned he's he's very important to to Celtic um, and um, to Celtic season. This season he was important last season. Um, and with the with the Denmark team, he's he's um, the competition is fierce, but he's he's not you know he's not frightened of the competition. Um, he's doing everything he can to to try and get into the team. Um, and when he's been with us. He's uh, he's showed his his quality and um, yeah we'll we'll keep following uh, Matt's progress. He's looking into a, a very exciting end to to this season, um, and I'm pretty sure that he's going to do everything he can to get into our squad um, at the same time as helping helping his club because he is a he, he is a real team player. He has been an absolutely. Unbelievable form for Celtic since he signed, but particularly this season, adding a lot more goals and assists to his game. We will get to your career, Morton, but I just want to stick with Matt for the, the time being. Take us back to when you first came across Matt. Was it when he was at Celtic, when he first broke into the team? I think uh, it was not long after he, he signed for Celtic because um, we, I was, I was uh, the assistant manager uh, with Denmark, but we had um, 
an under twenty one um, uh, Denmark manager whose name is Jesper Sorensen, who's now with uh, Brøndby. And I spoke to him uh, as we do about players, and he said, um, "There's this player uh, who, who's just joined Celtic, uh, Matt O'Reilly, and we're aware that he's he's uh, half Danish. Uh, he's got a Danish parent. He has." been with some of the I think he was under 16 or under 17 um teams of, of Denmark before. Um he's just joined Celtic. I want to go across and see him and talk to him. Would you like to join me because with because of your Celtic background and and I said yeah it would be a pleasure. So this is maybe going back yeah you maybe you maybe know that better than me about two years, just over two years, something yeah, like that. 2020 to yeah. Yeah, so the first objective was to, to see whether Matt was uh, eligible to play for Denmark, whether he was interested, because obviously we don't want to force anybody. We, we, we welcome any player that's eligible to play for Denmark. Uh, if they have the quality and if they, they want to play for Denmark, then, then they, they, are, they are very welcome. And we came across to see Matt and... We watched the game, uh, the uh, uh, Bordeaux uh, European game at Celtic Park, and spoke to to Matt. I think the the following day, and um, it turned out he was very uh, interested and motivated to to play for Denmark. And and he was uh, at first he was picked for to play for the under twenty ones, uh, but we sensed right away he was a, a genuine lad, um, a football player who is very ambitious, wants to work on his game. And we obviously we, we we kept following his progress. We had a, a training session in the summer for it was a mix between um, under twenty one players and full international players uh, because there was a, a lag between the end of the season and um, the the June uh, international games. And Matt came along and he um, he did well. Um, he didn't have to come along. It was. Uh, um, voluntarily, um, but um, I think that's that. That goes to show that he he really wants to to progress. He wants to play for Denmark, and um, and he was an, an important member of that under twenty one team. And since then, we followed his progress. And then last year, he got his chance in um, in the full uh, international uh, Danish setup. And um, it's. Um, yeah, the rest is history. We, we now we're here, and uh, I'm sure Matt wants to do everything possible to get into to the to to the Euro squads. Most definitely, and I know that Matt has personally name checked yourself on a number of occasions when talking about his call ups to Denmark, and it it must be nice for yourself, Morton, to have that Celtic link again. And I'm assuming that you've come back over fairly regularly to see Matt and just to. To catch up with Celtic and Glasgow again, it must be quite nice. It's always nice to to come back to to Glasgow and Scotland and to meet people, um, and to get the chance to get into um, to visit um, the Celtic training training ground and Celtic Park. Of course, uh, I was there last year. Um, there was an event for the the ninety seven ninety eight. Some of the the boys were there um, from that squad, and and. Um, I used to stay to to go in and have a look at the training as well and have a look at Matt and speak to people uh, and it's always a pleasure. Um, so many good memories um, to have that Celtic link is something that lingers on and it'll never it'll never go away, uh, thankfully. Well, look, Morton, why don't we get into your career now and your career in Scotland didn't start at Celtic. It started in 1992 in Dundee. Uh, I don't know if that's the start of the, the change in your accent as well, Morton. I think if a lot of people shut their eyes and listen to you, they wouldn't really be able to tell exactly where you're from. So a little bit of Dundonian and Glaswegian and, and Danish in there. Um, but take us back to, to that time, joining Dundee in 1992. What was it about Scotland and Dundee that made you want to, to come over? To be to be honest with you, I I was... Dundee got in touch uh, fairly early in the season, uh, and the reason being that um, I was with Lingby in Denmark, and we played we played Rangers uh, in a in a qualifier for the Champions League um, that season, and I had two good games, um, and so did the did our team. But uh, 
Dundee showed an interest in taking me across and they 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 were persistent. Uh, I wasn't too sure. We we didn't get much Scottish football at the time uh, on Danish TV. It was all it was all English football. Uh, so and I didn't I didn't know Dundee, but there was something in me that thought you know I I, I uh, it was interesting. Um, so we the Danish season uh, is, is is set up like we we have a winter break. So I played the the rest of the the season until uh, December. And then I had made up my mind about joining Dundee and trying uh, to see what Scottish football was like. Um, I had been watching some games on video to see, um, and I joined a Dundee team which was close to the the bottom of the league, and it was it was it was hard times, but uh, a very international team, um, and that um, was the introduction of, of Scottish football to me. Uh, and looking back, I'm so I'm so grateful. I'm so uh, mm, I'm so pleased that I I did take the take the chance uh, because that gave me the chance not only to play for Dundee, which has a, a rich his, history and and I met some great people there, uh, had some fantastic teammates, but it also gave me the chance to to join Celtic later on, three years later on uh, down the line and. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm not just saying that because I'm on 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 this podcast, but uh, that was that was the, the the pinnacle of my career. This you know the the, the six and a half years I had at Celtic um, is something uh, that's definitely the <clears throat> what I remember as the the best time of my my footballing career. Amazing. Well, why don't you take us through the move to Celtic then? Because as you mentioned, joined Dundee in 1992. You joined Celtic in the December of, of 1995. However, I find it's quite an interesting story because Dundee are relegated into the First Division, um, now the, the Championship, as we call it in Scotland. Um, you had a couple of seasons there, but your performances are still extremely high. In actual fact, during that time, you get your first cap for Denmark. And it's quite unusual to see a player outside the top division in Scotland getting an international call-up and then also then getting a move to Celtic as well. So talk us through how that move all came about, and was it something that surprised you at all? Uh, a little bit, uh, but I'll, I'll go back. Uh, you're absolutely right. It was it was unusual for somebody playing in the, the second tier of Scottish football to get picked for Denmark because there were quite a few good players there um, in the in the in the uh, squad and a lot of. Um, players to pick from and there was a bit of criticism um, um, towards re, uh, the late Richard Muller Nielsen who, who picked me but he actually came across to watch a game uh, if I believe rightly it was at Dunbarton uh, he was a very um, he was a very particular man and he did his homework uh, he remembered me from the the, the, the Denmark under 21 team um, and so I know um I know that you had uh, he, he held a high regard for Scottish football. Um, so he came across and watched me, and he he picked me uh, for a game against Finland at home, and he took a bit of stick for that because people were saying, "Why are you picking somebody from the second um, second tier of Scottish football when we have so many good players in domestic Danish football and even abroad?" Um, and again, I'm I'm grateful that he did, and I, I'm I'm pretty sure that I didn't let anyone down. Um, I went on to get a, a few caps, and in that debut of mine, when I came off the pitch, I scored a, I scored a goal in a two-one win. Um, so, I, I, I played for Dundee. We, I was in the Danish team that won the uh, internet intercontinental cup. Denmark had won the, the Euros '92, uh, uh, beat Germany in the final. So, through that, we qualified for the intercontinental cup in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, 90, 94, early 94, I think. Yeah, early 94. Um, so I was in that squad and I, I got one or two caps, uh, another few caps for Denmark, playing for Dundee. And this is pre Bosman. So my contract was actually up in the summer of 95, but I, I signed, if not weekly deals, it was fortnightly deals with Dundee. Um, it's just as a, a rolling um, contract thing, and and uh, 
to be quite honest, I was pre pretty close. I, I felt my time being involved with the, 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 the Denmark team, uh, I needed a new challenge. Um, so I was pretty close to signing for a Danish team at the time. Um, but thankfully I didn't. And um, Jim Duffy, who was my manager at Dundee, uh, pulled me aside one day and said, um, I've spoken to Tommy Burns, um, the, the late Tommy Burns. Um, he wants to, to take you to Celtic if you're interested. And I said, oh, that would be, um, that would be just the right challenge for me. And uh, funnily enough, uh, one of my teammates, Jerry Britton, uh, who's, who's got Celtic links as well, um, he was at Celtic before he joined Dundee, had taken me across to, to Glasgow to watch the European game uh, that Celtic played against Paris Saint-Germain in that season, uh, 95. Uh, so that's a, whether that's a coincidence or a, a, a sign, uh, I don't know, but um, it's, a, it's quite a funny story. Uh, but to, to cut things short, I, I jumped at the chance. I, I had a, a chat with, with uh, Tommy uh, before I signed, and I, I couldn't wait to, to get started. I knew I came into a very successful a side that was playing very well, uh, dying to, to win that champion um, championship, um, to win that league. Um, and you felt, I felt uh, Tommy's passion for Celtic right away. Um, and I joined, and I joined a, a great team, some very, very good teammates um, who I count as, as, as good friends today. And um, we played some great football that season. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't enough. I think we lost one game. Uh, it wasn't enough to, to win the league. Um, and that's possibly my only regret. If I look through the, the whole uh, period of my time at Celtic, that we couldn't, we couldn't win that league for for obviously the fans but also Tommy Burns who he had such a desire to to win the league and we played some some nice football uh, but we just couldn't we just couldn't do it at the time thankfully that that came later on I'm going to pre-warn you because I'm, I'm going to ask for your best Tommy Burns story in a, in a little while but to make that jump from Dundee in the second tier of Scottish football to Celtic of course you're playing for the Denmark national team who had just won the Euros in 92, as you said. So you were used to playing with a, a high calibre of player there. But what was it like then coming into the Celtic changing room where you had some really big names at the time and, you know, John Collins, Pierre van Hooydonk and, and all those types? It was it was amazing. Um, I I knew that it was going to be hard work to, to work my way into the team. Um, Tommy Burns hadn't been, you know, telling me stories. He, he said it's 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 a very good team, some very good players. But I, I relished the challenge. I also, um, I felt I felt so great about being in a, a team surrounded by very good players because I knew um, that's that 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 was going to raise my own game. Um, when you play alongside great players you're going to look better uh, and you, you're you going to enjoy your football. And that was exactly it. And we were playing some very, very good stuff at the time uh, that season. Um, so it wasn't as if I was overawed by uh, these big names. I remember doing some extra work with John Collins, um, some fast feet, feet work. John was a, a great professional. So I was just trying to take it, take it all in and um, do everything I could to, to improve. Uh, and I just felt I just felt at home. I felt as if this was just the right move for me at that stage of my career. Um, so, uh, and and you know, also the familiar feeling to the club made it very difficult to to fit in and and feel at home. Well, this is now where I'm going to throw some names at you. So I pre-warned you about Tommy Burns. So I'm looking for something with him because usually everybody does, but also. In recent weeks, we've had a few people on the podcast who you'll know very well from that side. I'm thinking John Hughes, Peter Grant that have been on, because it's quite a dressing room, quite a lot of characters. So what are your memories of, of some of those individuals, and particularly Tommy? Yeah, well, that, I mean, great, great teammates. Uh, Peter Grant had played so many games for Celtic, and you, as I, 
I, uh, I mentioned Tommy's passion for for Celtic, Tommy Burns' passion for Celtic. Peter was, Granny was right up there. I mean, he had the same, um, he had the same thing. Uh, he was Celtic through and through, uh, but also a, 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 a lad who, you know, he would, he would take out on you. And, uh, but through that, you would, you would feel, yeah, it's, uh, you're one of, you're one of the family. Um, and I was sitting not too far from Granny in the dressing room. So, there was a uh, quite a few pranks uh, <laughs> along the way. I couldn't, I couldn't even tell you. I just remember there were so many, and there were so many characters. Um, Tom Boyd is another one. Celtic through and through. Um, Tosh McKinley. So many of the, the you had the you had the Scottish uh, influence uh, and the, the you know players who were Celtic through and through, and then you had the the the, the foreign. Um, contingent um and while we're talking about mad characters uh you know paulo di Canio springs to mind i in the dressing room he was so passionate on the pitch but in the dressing room you you never knew what was going to happen and you mentioned granny i remember paulo and, and granny they were always always at it against each other so you you wouldn't know what was coming next um so i but but very lively and and great to be part of. But you knew once once the whistle went on the training ground, and um, not the least in in games, you knew they were going to be absolutely fired up and uh, wanting to do everything they could for for the club. So as you said, you come into the squad just narrowly missed out and winning the title in that season. Um, Tommy Burns eventually, as we kind of roll on a couple of years, leaves the club as manager. We get to the summer of 1997 and the pressure is firmly on Celtic's shoulders to make sure that we go and deliver the title that season. We have a change of manager and Vim Janssen who comes in. We bring in some new players, particularly one Henrik Larsson. Morton, that's probably one of your defining seasons as a Celtic player in terms of your importance to the squad in terms of appearances but take us into that period in the summer what are your memories about the changes that were happening the pressure on the club and how the team in that period worked together to end up winning the title oh there was pressure all right um I would say that's that's the that's the most pressure I've felt um throughout my career um everyone knew that I remember we went on a on a pre-season camp in Holland, and things were far from finished. We, uh, uh, Wim Janssen came in late. Um, there were uncertainty. There was there were a few players leaving the club, uh, having left the club, um, and everyone knew this was going to be most the one of the most important seasons for years and years for the club. Uh, some of the new guys that came in. Uh, could rightly say, well, we haven't played uh, for the past nine years, uh, but they were sucked into it because everyone was part of it. And I think that was uh, one of the re main reasons why everyone knew they had to pull together. We had to deal quickly once the, the squad was was um, put together. And that happened quite late. We were well into the season before uh, the, the, the squad was... was um, was uh, full of the players that was going to, you know, finish the season and, and play throughout the season. Um, so it it was, as a player, uh, I'd been there um, for some time at, uh, before we, we reached this season. Um, so I was pretty aware of what was at stake. Um, and you just had to, as a player, you had to, to focus on what you had to do. You had to prepare physically. Uh, you had to you know, be ready for the new players coming in, for, for the new manager, um, new style of, um, of play, um, because you knew this was going to be a very important season. So there was no, there was not a lot of time dwelling on the fact that things were not looking uh, finished. Um, so, yeah, you had to basically focus on what you, what was your role and then just wait and see who came in. Um, I remember a preseason game over in Holland, and, and there was there was a bit of 
a turmoil and I was at Groningen. We played for, for, for one of the preseason games and, and, and things were getting, were, at that stage, were already getting a bit nervy. Um, so we all knew this could be a, um, a it was going to be a defining season and it was going to be a season where we had to really try and keep, keep cool heads uh, all around. Um, when the season started, um, well, everyone knows it, it, it didn't start too well. Um, and now you mentioned Henrik, who went on to become a, a Celtic legend. Uh, what a player, what a man. Uh, but the beginning of his Celtic career wasn't great. Um, away to Hibs, at home to Dunfermline. So we started off uh, losing those two games and and he didn't have particularly good games. Uh, but I have to say, what a what a turnaround. Uh, I think we went on to, to win the next seven or eight games on the trot. Um, and I'm sure you're going to ask me more questions about the season. But um, yeah, thankfully it went went well. Uh, winning the double and um, and you know just doing well for all the the Celtic fans that had been you know crying out for this league for years and years. So after losing the first couple of games, I have to admit I was not old enough to to remember that season. So I don't really I won't know what it was like, what the hysteria was like after losing those first couple of games. So tell us how the squad under Vim managed to turn it around after those opening defeats. What was the catalyst for the squad to make that winning form come come around? It's a very, very good question. I think we needed time. That's one of the, the obvious ones. We we needed time as a squad, as a team to gel. Uh, but we didn't have time. So um, we, we won uh, the third game in, in question. Was it St. Johnston away? I'm pretty sure. Um, uh, and but we still had things to work on. Um, but when you win games, um, it gives the players, the team, a belief that we're going in the right direction. We were signing very good players. Uh, Paul Lambert came in later on. Craig Burley was still new uh, to the team. Uh, and you have to remember, we still had some very good players. I know the players that had been there had taken some stake for being part of a team. Um, that hadn't been able to win the league for for some years, but we still have very good players: Jackie McNamara, Tom uh, Tom Boyd, um, Tosh McKinley, um, uh, Alan Stubbs. Um, uh, as you say, Henrik came in, Harold came in, um, so players came in to 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 join the squad to to add to so just uh, Dan Jackson came in. Um, Reggie Blinker. So uh, slowly we started to gel and started to get things right. Uh, we had a, a new manager um, in Wim and his assistant Murdo, uh, who were very calm. And I think that was that was key as well that you had a manager uh, and a coaching staff who who could keep calm under under nervous circumstances. Um, there were plenty of people telling us that. Um, telling us all about the things that could go wrong. So that, that influence was, was very important. Um, a calm head in the, um, in the coaching staff. We'll get to that final game against St. Johnson in just a little bit. But I want to ask you about what moments stand out for you throughout the season. Are there any defining games, any memories, atmospheres, goals that really stick to your mind when you think back to that season? Uh, you said you, we were going to get back to the last one. The, obviously, the, I would I would say the second last one, not for obvious reasons, because we we didn't win the game at Dunfermline. Uh, we came close. Um, I think we were winning one nil until what ten minutes before the the end of the game, and of course it had to go all the way to to the last game of the season. Uh, what a long week that was! What a long wait. Um, but there were games along the way uh, for me. One of the best memories, uh, although we, we got beat and Liverpool knocked us out um, of the UEFA Cup, that was a, that was, those two games were great, especially the, the game at home, the two-each game, uh, because of the atmosphere. 
and the, the the bonding between the fans, the noise, the atmosphere. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't take the win. Uh, and to that this day, when whenever I've watched that second Liverpool goal, um, McManaman, who took the ball deep in his own half, and I was the first one to to try and put put him under pressure. Uh, I still think, ah, why didn't I just put a a leg out to to stop him in in his tracks because he went on to, oh, he ran what eighty yards to, and then he put the ball in the back of the net. But um, great goal, um, but a fantastic game and um, what an atmosphere. And I, I I will I will always remember. I'm always gonna remember that game for something special because of the the. Um, European nights are always special um, at Celtic, but against Liverpool, with that setting, with the the bonding of the fans singing together, um, is something special. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't take it all the way with that Drew nil uh, nil away from home. But that's special. That game was special, and it still it gave us belief. Uh, we, we played against a, a very good English side uh, and and ran them close. Um, that game and then the um, the Coca Cola Cup final, uh, I remember in in particular as well. Although it wasn't a league game, it was um, it was a it was a cup win. It's a it was a title, and it was early in the season, March I think, and that gave us the maybe the, the another boost. Um, apart from the way we were playing in the league, it gave us a boost going into the 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 the, the latter part of the the, the season. Um, to go and finish the the league off and win it. We've had a lot of guests on the podcast this season and in previous that have spoken about that week before the St Johnson game, about the pressure, about what went on in training beforehand. Um, a little bit of you know, I think one of the stories that Vim sent sent the team home after one of the training sessions at Celtic Park because it it wasn't going too great. But take us into for your perspective, Morton. What was going on in your head in the days before and in the day of? Because footballers are very accustomed to having a lot of the same conversations. We just focused on the next game. We try not to get overawed. But I can only imagine just what you were thinking and going through going into that game against St. Johnson. Yeah, it was a, I, I felt right after the game against Dunfermline, I had to, um, I played most of the season, um, most of the games. From the in the in the starting lineup, but then Finn game I came off the bench for the past uh, last ten or fifteen minutes. We didn't manage, but I, f- I felt right after the game. I thought, like most of the other lads, I think I thought, let's play this game tomorrow. Let's play St Johnston tomorrow. We we cannot wait. We have to get this over and done with. We have to win it. Have to win the league. Uh, that wasn't possible, of course. We had to wait wait a, a full week and. Then the days were just long, and uh, I, as far as I remember, we were given a couple of days off, uh, and then we we started um, gearing up towards the last game of the season, and it, it was nervy. Um, and there had been, there had been, of course, when you have a, a a squad of of very good players, and and only eleven can play, you will have frustrations. You all, all also had the the World Cup coming up, and you had players that, in order to get picked. For their uh, respective countries um, and national teams, they had to play. And um, if they weren't playing in their for their club, uh, in this case Celtic, they they were not sure of getting picked. So things. But at the same time, you're in this same team, and, and to be fair, there were frustrations. But I felt everyone knew that we had to to stick together as a group to get this uh, to get this. Um, to get this done, uh, to get the job done and win the league. And um, going into that game on the final day, I remember Wim uh, pulling me me into his office. Um, I wasn't sure whether I was a starter or not. And he pulled me in and said, you're, you're starting on the bench today. And I had to put all uh, personal disappointment aside, uh, which I thought I did. Uh, I said, fine, uh, I'll be ready. Whenever you, you feel uh, you need me, I'll be ready. Um, and and that was it from a personal perspective. Um, and I was just living the game from the bench and watching. Um, so I remember very well uh, Henrik scoring that first goal to settle the the initial nerves on the day. Great goal, and um, and 
I always remember St. Johnson didn't have much in the game, but they did hit the bar. Um, so it was it was nervy. Uh, but thankfully, Harold got, got that second goal late in the game, and I came on late in the game to try and 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 just stay the ship and and um, and help the, help the team um, get over the line and and so we did and it was a massive team effort and everyone you felt even the boys that weren't even on the, on the bench they they were so so happy for everyone for the fans and the team teammates uh, manager coaching staff um, and everyone just put those personal issues aside for for the day everyone knew they had been part of something. Um, massive, something very big, um, and I remember the the scenes of joy uh, in the stands. Either people were were crying or they were jumping about mad, um, and I'll remember. I'll never remember. I'll never forget uh, those scenes. Um, amazing. Where does that rank for you in your career, Morton? Because to do something so special for a football club to be part of that with all the pressure is amazing but also for yourself you were such an integral part of that team playing so much football in that season so where does that moment when the full-time whistle goes rank in your career uh, right up there um if not top of the the list because it was it was a very uh, special season uh, everyone sensed that i've been in scottish football for well since 92 uh, so I had a, a clear feeling of what this meant. I'd been at Celtic for a couple of years, um, and I knew exactly what what it meant to the fans. Um, uh, and we also got told, if not on a daily basis, then really, really often, um, that how much this meant to the fans. So to actually go and do it with the 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 initial uh, struggles we had uh, with the uncertainty was massive and I, as you say i think it's i think it's fair to say this was my personally this was, was my best season of the six and a half years i had at a celtic um because of the number of games i played because of the the whole situation because of the yeah the the the, the team i was in so it's something that ranks right up there i've, I've played for my nation for my my country played in the world cup but I think this season, uh, as a whole, would have to rank as the as the number one. It's really, really incredible memories, and it's something that it's always amazing to hear the people that were involved their their side of the story again. And I'm sure a lot of Celtic fans will enjoy hearing about that. But then, from such a high, Morton, just a day or so afterwards, Vim Janssen calls time on his time as Celtic manager. I mean, how much shock was there in the group? And did that really have a bit of a gut-wrenching feeling after having such a high just a few days before? Definitely. It was like, yeah, well, going from heaven to hell uh, in a very short space of time. But I had, um, when it all happened, I thought, yeah, of course, of course this was going to happen because that leading up to the end of the season, my contract was running out uh, at the end of the season, and I had, I really wanted to stay, uh, especially especially the way things were going, um, and we were going to play in, in Europe as well. Um, we were on course to to do something great with the team, so I I went to see uh, the manager uh, to see whether he would, what was his opinion on on myself, and uh, would I would I have a, a role to play the following season and then the meeting a couple of meeting, meetings i had were strange and he, he didn't he he didn't tell me straight and i thought that's strange is it because he doesn't want me in the in the squad or is there something else but again i had to i had to focus on what was in front of us this was towards the end of the season uh I, so there was a lot at stake so i had to be professional i also had to prepare myself to go to the World Cup with Denmark. Um, and then we finished the season, won the league. And then when it all transpired, um, that Wim had resigned. And, and then I thought, of course, he couldn't He couldn't tell me. He was professional. He, he, he didn't want to say, I'm not here to upset any anything, just to be professional. But I, I thought, yeah, of course, 
of course this was going to happen uh, because he, the, the answers he gave me didn't really make sense to me um and then in a yeah in a very short space of time things were just uncertain again just the way things had been before the the, the magical season it was it was just a but then from a personal point of view you had to focus on I'm going to the, the 98 World Cup with Denmark and um, I didn't even go on that Portugal trip with the uh, the team after the end of the season. We we had to go and, and prepare with Denmark and um, yeah, so it, it's a shame and that's the way football works, um, even more so these days. We had so many, you have so many more games, but things move very quickly uh, and this was an, an early example of that back in, in 98.